I truly appreciated the words that Pam shared with us about the Stevens ministry, but while she was speaking, two things popped into my head. The first one was, do I get the short straw all the time? (laughs) But the other one, more important, was I didn't plan it this way, but I believe this might be the spirit at work. This sermon could be talking about Stephen's ministry. Now maybe you've heard or seen this movie many times over the years. It was the 2000 movie called Castaway starring Tom Hanks. If you haven't for some unknown reason, seen it on television or in the theater. Let me just tell you a little about it. It's a 21st century rendition or spin on Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. Castaway and Caruso, which was printed in 1719, are separated by three centuries but each is a saga of humanity's ability to survive and for the person to rediscover himself or herself and what truly is important. In Castaway, Hank's character, Chuck Noland, a FedEx employee, ends up being the sole survivor of a plane crash thereby setting in motion this modern-day Caruso. He ends up stranded on an uninhabited, uncharted island. And in the process, Nolan befriends a volleyball, the only other survivor. This is his Friday, but he doesn't call it Friday. He calls it Wilson, because that's the name on it. And over the course of time, he carries on all these conversations with Wilson, creating almost an anthropomorphic relationship with Wilson. Hanks came up with this idea for the film. He said, it's a metaphor for casting away the trappings of everyday life in order to find what is truly important. Now, Defoe may have started in a different place, but that was certainly part of his Crusoe saga. Defoe's 17th century Robinson Crusoe is a man running from the past, a past of family expectations, a past of being a former slave and then being a slave trader himself, a past of being a plantation owner and being a survivor of two shipwrecks, the last one landing him on an island of isolation. This man's life storms shipwrecked him in many different ways, causing fear and mistrust, creating a sense of betrayal and loss, a time full of tragedy and loneliness and uncertainty. But it was also a time of rewards for him. Rewarding him by reawakening his very soul. Rewarding him by giving him a resurgence of life. And by bringing him redemption. These stories, Castaway and Robinson Crusoe, 
also speak, in my opinion, to the resilience and resourcefulness of the human spirit. Building a home, planting a garden, contending with the elements, self-protection, and eventually discovery of what truly was and is important for that person. What also ties these characters together is expectations. As I said earlier, Caruso was a man full of expectations. He lived a life of them. From his early days as a child growing up into his early years as an adult. His family expected him to practice law. His society expected him to attend church, even though he wasn't particularly religious. And while at church, he would perform the various expected rituals, singing the hymns, reading the liturgies, praying, standing, kneeling, taking Holy Communion, and on and on and on. These were the external expectations that he was fulfilling. But nothing internally was happening to him. Nothing was really touching him. Nothing was stirring his soul. He might as well have been the walking dead. He met the familial and societal expectations, but in the process he neglected any sense of community or commitment or relationship to his God. Thank goodness Defoe's character, Caruso, was a little OCD. Obsessive compulsive, that is because it meant that he kept a log, a notebook, a journal of his daily life. And here's one of the entries in that journal of his from June the 28th, in the year of our Lord, 1680. He referred, he feared for his life because he was dealing with a fever at that time. And in the log, it speaks of him being caused to do two things he hadn't done in a long time. The one was he prayed for the first time while on that island. And the other thing he did was he read from the only book he had, the Bible. And he read that very last verse that was just read from Psalm 50. Verse 15. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. This verse has three parts to it. It has a call, a promise, and a response. And from this verse, Caruso began a major discovery of self-realization. He found himself delivered from, starting to be delivered from a spiritual hell that he had unknowingly been living in for years. And he began to realize the importance of outside community, especially because he was all alone. 
And that was a physical hell. The two of these hells were interconnected, and they still are for us. Separating ourselves from a relationship with Almighty God and separating ourselves from a relationship with one another. A spiritual and a physical hell. Now, for Robinson Crusoe, there were a series of circumstances that allowed him to escape, if you will, from the physical hell he had been living. It came in the form of the introduction of another character to the plot. Initially, Crusoe saw this character as being a thing. An uneducated, ignorant savage. But as their connectedness grew, as their relationship developed, he began to see this thing's humanity. And they became comrades, student, teacher, friends even. It got to the point that Crusoe even called him by a name, Friday, commemorating the day of the week that they met. Now, Robinson Crusoe is a metaphor for life. And it has many different takeaways that the reader can grasp hold of. For me, my takeaway is the relational piece. For example, when I've preached, I probably learn more than I've given. And I'm the one that's more often blessed and rewarded, challenged and informed. And I'm sure you've also experienced similar experiences in your lives as you've taught, as you've instructed, as you've worked alongside coworkers. You plan, you prepare, you expect to take on a, a certain role. Then suddenly, out of the blue, everything's changed. You're not playing that role that you had planned for and expected to do. You're not doing what you had prepared for. Everything's different than what you expected. And some here, I've heard the phrase used to describe this kind of a situation. They call it the BAM factor. Others call it the X factor. You're knocked off your feet. You're knocked off balance. You're not quite sure which direction to go because this is uncharted territory. And you're a little unsure of what's happening. But then, then something happens. Things seem to come together. Things appear to make sense and you start to see a new role emerging for yourself. You're no longer the giver, you're the receiver. You're no longer the teacher but the student. You're no longer the minister but the ministered unto. This happens to us more often than we would care to think. And it's done in such subtle ways that we sometimes don't even see it happening to us. And what I'm talking about is something that's good. It's good for the soul. Because in the process of doing this, in the process of being in this journey of yours, you're really finding yourself being released from those 
past expectations others have put on to you. You're released from all the pressures that you've allowed yourself to be overwhelmed by. You're released and you're allowed to be who you are. You're allowed to let yourself grow. Business leaders have written books about this. Being pleasantly surprised by younger employees offering new ways of addressing old problems. Coaches, as we start this collegiate football season, get excited when new team members show up and show them a different way of achieving the same outcome. And old fossiled pastors and heads of staff become re-energized by the excitement, the inspiration, and the vitality of new staff members. My personal story surrounds a dear, dear friend, the Reverend Dr. J. Robert Hewitt, a man I was very fortunate to call a friend who passed away earlier this year. Bob was a true friend who I first served on the staff of in the first church I was called to, East Liberty Presbyterian Church. And that relationship continued from that point on, 30 plus years. He and I would talk maybe four, five, six times a year, touching base on various things. He first took the role of being my boss, my supervisor. Then he became my mentor. Then, somewhere along the line, he became a colleague and eventually a friend. And at the passing of my father, Bob became my father figure, if you will. And I could call him about anything, and he was always there, greeting me with one of those wonderful southern expressions of his, welcoming me and giving me a sense of hope, a sense of purpose, and a little wiser than when I started the conversation, because he showed me different ways of approaching or of seeing something. The last time Bob and I talked, which was about two days before his passing, he bowled me over, he surprised me with these last words of his. As we were starting to say our goodbyes on the phone, he said to me something like this, Ewan, thanks for everything you taught me. Wow, that was not what I expected. What a surprise that was. My go-to guy was the one thanking me for what I taught him. He got it all mixed up. Must have been a moment of dementia for him. <laughs> but my goodness, when we hung up, that meant so much to me. Thank you for all you taught me. When I started thinking about this sermon and working on it and started to put together this image of Castaway and then Robinson Crusoe and so forth, I immediately found myself going back to that relationship with Bob. Crusoe was a teacher, a leader, an expert, but at some point he became a receiver, a student, a learner of Fridays. 
No longer was Caruso standing on the sidelines or going through the motions. He was living, truly living. Bob taught me that. Bob taught me the importance of relationship and how it can be so wonderful and how it can help me grow and be that which God intends me to be. So I leave you with a question here this morning. It's a very simple question, but I think it's a very deep question if you're willing to take it to that next level. It's, who is your Friday? Who is your Friday? The Fridays of your world need you. And you need them. Because of you, they are better people. But because of them, you're a better person too. You're a better colleague, a better friend, a better spouse, a better advisor, a better, better individual. You're more empathetic. You're more understanding. You're more real. You're more authentic. And they help you rise to that new level of life that God wants you to claim. And as you grow in that relationship, you're really becoming more human. Like Friday, you move from the savage to the human. And like Caruso, you begin to see and truly celebrate life as it's intended to be. In the name of God the Creator, Christ the Reconciler, and the Redeeming Spirit, amen.